We were on record. We were on the iCloud. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Jim Frame. I'm your uh, host tonight and your EMS Medical Director for PERCOM. And I welcome you to our continuing series on toxidromes. There are certain uh, toxicologies that we have to focus on. Others I can present like in a group and such like that. But tonight uh, we're going to have a very peculiar one. Now, as many of you may or may not know, I am a new test writer now to the uh, National Registry of Emergency Medical Technician, both the basic and paramedic. Uh, based out of uh, Ohio. Uh, I've been asked to join them by Jeremy Miller and some of the others that are out there, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. As a result, I've had an opportunity to, re to review test banks, and I will hopefully share some of those test bank questions. Obviously, ethical reasons I can't share with you the exams, but having the insight that I do on the uh, exams now is going to enhance my ability to give you uh, more pertinent lectures as they pertain to the National Registry test. I'm confident each and every one of you will figure out a way on how to function in the exam. Um, thanks, Graham, appreciate it. Uh, you'll be able to function in the street very well. However, for the exam purposes, and let's face it, uh, we're, we're all in it to pass the exam to get red patched and move forward with our careers. And Our careers will dictate what is familiar, what our demographics are within our area, whether we get more gunshots, medical runs, geriatrics, pediatrics, toxidromes, et cetera, uh, we become expert in those areas. So this evening, uh, after reviewing an exam just yesterday on medical emergencies, we found that about 16% of the test has to do with medical emergencies, and a good part of that obviously has to do with thyroid and parathyroid hormones, regulation of calcium, and uh, thyroid uh, storm, mixed edema comas, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and then somewhere down the medical emergencies, of course, you get into toxicology, which has to do with the toxidromes that we've been talking about. Today, we're going to focus on one particular toxidrome, that's going to be the hydrocarbons. The reason why I focus on hydrocarbons is that was what I picked up from the test bank and from the examination is that a huge amount of it has to do with hydrocarbons. I'm going to give you some uh, do's and don'ts in some uh, areas where we run into pitfalls uh, with these uh, types of uh, toxidromes. Uh, let's see if I can't get my whiteboard pulled up here. And... All right, uh, before we get started, uh, everybody see this okay? You just respond real quickly on your... Uh... We don't see anything, okay, darn it. How about now? I think I fixed it. Okay, right, let's get into the slideshow then. All right, toxicology of hydrocarbons. This is a, a hot area on the National Registry exam for the paramedics. Uh, the EMT has to concern themselves with toxicology and spo poisonings only from the standpoint of identify the poison, pick up, get oxygen on them if they turn cyanotic, and to get them into the emergency department. However, for the paramedic, toxicology of hydrocarbons becomes a challenge. And the challenge is really is identifying the substance and what the anticipated complications are. You could be as near as 10 minutes away from the hospital, which would, in that case would mandate probably only an oxygen start, maybe IV fluids and such. But as soon as you start getting out 15, 20, 25 minutes out, or perhaps even 30 minutes from the time you put them on a stretch until you time at the door, uh, there's going to be other opportunities for you to uh, intervene in these patients. 
So the first and foremost, uh, hydrocarbons are organic substances, they're carbon and hydrogen molecules. And you should know that these are mostly gasoline, oil, mineral spirits, etc. You can read the uh, uh, PowerPoint as well as I can. And by the way, uh, this will be posted to the uh, PERCOM uh, share site so that you'll be able to review uh, the PowerPoint presentation as it relates to hydrocarbons. Now, of course, we're going to see them in rubber, cement, and solvents, but you should know that there's a lot of euphoric effects that can come from glue and its propellants, and, and that's going to be, become very significant, especially in uh, the younger patient, the juvenile or the young teenager who like to do huffing or bagging and such like that. This, is, this becomes a real problem. Um, All right, uh, I think I got to, there may, be, there may be some issues here. So everybody who's listening to this right now, can you see the slide presentation? Very good, okay. All right, well, thank you for doing that. I just want to make sure we're still a little bit new to this system, uh, but we're learning more, and today's the first time I'm using the whiteboard. But again, if, uh, if you can't see it for some reason, uh, just uh, uh, hold tight, try to play with it a little bit. If you can't find it, of course, it'll be on the PERCOM website. Now, the recreational use of inhaled hydrocarbons was a fad for quite a while there. There's glue sniffing and huffing and bagging and all the other things that were going on, all the, all the cool things that made the kids kind of high. Unfortunately, as a result of all this, we had a certain number of deaths as well related to, the, uh, uh, to this inhalation, if you would. There were some ingestions or some accidental um, inhalations and such from explosions or just from being around not well ventilated areas and such something you have to be aware of especially in mechanic garages and places where they use heavy machinery not so much the carbon monoxide that results from the uh, combustion of, uh, of piston engines but also from the solvents that are used they can cause quite a bit of problems for patients who inhale it. And where it becomes a big problem, especially is in the aircraft industry, because they use a lot of benzene, toluene, and some of the other hydrocarbons out there that short-term effects can be very deleterious. Long-term effects can be equally as deadly. And so what we're looking at really is the short-term effects. That's probably what you're going to be getting a call for. I wouldn't expect you to diagnose 30 years of exposure to asbestosis or uh, to benzene or naphthene or any of the other toxicologies that are out there. Just be aware if you pick up a patient one day that says, yeah, I got a blood disorder, uh, acute myelogenous leukemia because I was exposed to benzene for a lot of years. Well, at least you'll have some background idea. But from the uh, standpoint of uh, the acute care patient, uh, the last uh, point that I have on the slide here, several methods used for abuse, including sniffing, huffing, and uh, then bagging. Uh, these, these not only cause, obviously, hypoxic and anoxic events just from displacement of oxygen, a key point, but also from the effects of what happens when the chemical gets into the bloodstream kind of thing. What does it do? And we're going to touch on a lot of that today. And this is going to be the sole subject for today. Again, this will constitute between four and six questions on the National Registry exam, just hydrocarbon poison itself. Now, um, of course, you know, it's going to be the usual what organ systems does it affect? Well, uh, let's see, everything. Uh, pulmonary, neurological, cardiac, gastrointestinal, hepatic, renal, dermatological. I think that covers pretty much the body. But you should know, and this, is, uh, this was something that was on the test, what's the most commonly affected organ when it comes to these kind of uh, uh, hydrocarbons? I'm not going to tell you anything else except the most common system. Just know that it's inhaled. And thus, the most damaged organ system, the one most commonly affected, is the pulmonary system. So let's talk about pulmonary manifestations for a second. You're going to arrive on the scene, and you're going to see these people, altered mental status, lightheaded, dizzy, maybe even staggering around. Or they could have been passed out already and 
fortunate for some patients, they fall on their stomach, they vomit, it clears. Unfortunately for some people, they fall on their back, they vomit, they aspirate, bad news. The aspiration of hydrocarbons causes an aspiration pneumonitis, which carries a 100% mortality. If they aspirate, they will die. If they aspirate a lot, they will die sooner. The reason being, the hydrocarbons are not broken down or in any way altered by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Subsequently, when it comes back up, it goes through the esophagus and probably dissolves half of it, which leads to other problems within the thoracic cavity. But the most important thing is that when these hydrocarbons hit the lungs, they're very powerful vasoconstrictors. Now you've got the hydrocarbon combined with the hydrochloric acid. What you got yourself is a major league bronchoconstriction with now pulmonary edema developing as a result. If you get them lucky, you may only pick up the wheezing shortness of breath and a pulse oximetry of 60. Uh, I wouldn't mess around with CPAP, BiPAP, non-rebreathers or anything like that. And the vomiting patient that's been exposed to hydrocarbons, you should go right to your RSA. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the slide presentation. Now, central nervous system. So we talked about pulmonary, now we're gonna go central nervous system. Well, if you're lightheaded, dizzy and staggering around, it's not because you're intoxicated in traditional sense of ethanol, uh, alcohol, but that you've got um, uh, these hydrocarbons that are making their way into the brain. Now, the brain loves fat, lipophilic. Philic means love. I love this. Lipophilic. I love lipoproteins. I love fat. That's why we get liposuction off our waistline because we love fat. The problem with hydrocarbons is that they are lipophilic. And so they will cross the blood brain barrier easily and start breaking down tissue within the brain as well if there's enough of it. Now remember, you have to inhale. It gets absorbed into the blood. There'll be some conversions within the blood and such, but it gets into the brain. And the first thing it does causes altered mental status. It gets real foggy and fuzzy up there. You got just way too much. And of course, you're, at the same time, you're displacing oxygen. But then we get into uh, stimulation of certain parts of the brain, which gives a euphoric feeling, especially in the hippocampus area, where we derive a lot of our life's pleasures uh, through everything that we do. And this heightened hippocampic area here is stimulated directly by the inhalation of of uh, hydrocarbon vapor. So that produces the euphoric effect where people start getting high. They can sniff it, they can huff it in a bag, they can, however they do it, they inhale it on purpose. These are the folks that we're worried about the most because they get the highest concentration. They're in a very small area there and their, their intent is to do this. Unfortunately, it causes everything from altered mental status to seizures. If a person does it long enough, let's say they're 18 years old and they like doing it at 18, then they like doing it at 19, then here comes age 20, 21, 22, and then finally they decide, uh, you know, I got to get my highs from someplace else. Uh, they've been slowly breaking down a lot of the white matter within the brain. By the time they're 35, they're mental midgets. Uh, not that they were incredibly smart to begin with doing this stuff, but their IQs are going to be somewhere around 60 or 70 uh, by the time they're 35. And they don't function very well within society. And very rarely, a number of these people live past the age of 40. They just break down into a dementia or Parkinson's disease that is just so wicked that uh, by the time that they're in their 40s and 50s, they... They're, they're virtually in a nursing home. They, they've forgotten how to do everything, including who they are and what they are. So prolonged, um, uh, prolonged exposures such as this, of course, you see in the last word here is Parkinsonism. Uh, Parkinson's disease is probably the, the end state here. Uh, you can uh, just surmise from there that people with Parkinson's disease just don't live that long. When they get the disease, it's usually a death sentence. We've got good medications and such to prolong it, but nobody can cure it. Now, let's go into the heart, that other organ that we can't live without. Exposure to hydrocarbons can cause cardiotoxicity, big surprise. When we give ourselves a nice big puff, nice big vapor huff or bag, of hydrocarbon vapor to produce that euphoric effect, 
unfortunately, the myocardium lowers its threshold for electrical potentials. So what used to take greater than 90 millivolts to stimulate a cardiac cell will now only take about 45. It'll take about half. Subsequently, throughout all of our lives, at any time in our lives, on any single day, if I put a halter monitor on each one of you good folks listening to this lecture, you will find that each one of you will have about 2,000 to 6,000 PVCs per day. Now, we resist it, we don't have any problems with it. A lot of times we don't feel it. If we do, we get a little palpitation, it goes away. Some folks feel it more, they can have upwards of 20,000 a day. Uh, this can be a concern. Now, to trigger that, all of a sudden, if your potential for stimulating any of your cells drops from 90 to 45, any one of these PVCs can therefore excite the other myocardial cells. That's why they call sensitization and subsequently throw you into V-fib or atrial fib, more often than not, V-fib, unrecoverable. If during the daytime you've been huffing and bagging a lot and all of a sudden something startles you and you get this epinephrine, this adrenaline release, that's the sensitization to catecholamines that we're talking about here as well. And so, you can make a run of VTAC, 15, 16 beats, and since it's pulseless, you pass out. And worst case scenario, you go pulseless for longer than that, go into a permanent vault, pulseless VTAC. And of course, kids not being as bright as they are, as soon as they see somebody laying down on the ground, they ha ha, he he. And uh, it takes EMS sometimes up to an hour to get there after finally somebody figures out that these people aren't moving and they're turning different shades of blue. But since all of them are doing the same thing in euphoric, they can't comprehend or they can, can they interpret the situation that's going on in front of them. It's the, it's a perfect storm of the worst of all scenarios. Let's move on to gastrointestinal. Before I do that, just to reiterate cardiac, sensitization to catecholamines, lowering of electrical potential, more prone to atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation at this point. Those are the arrhythmias you got to worry about. Okay, GI, as you would call it, as you would probably figure out, you irritate the mucosa long enough and hard enough, you're going to start nausea and vomiting. Uh, if you ingest any of this, uh, of course, <clears throat> you can get worse. It can dissolve through the esophagus. Once it gets into the stomach, it can dissolve through the gastric wall. If it doesn't dissolve through it, it's going to erode the hell out of it, in which case then you'll start with gastrointestinal bleeding, which can be very pronounced. And uh, these become a um, uh, very problematic for us in the emergency department to manage, even more problematic for the GI doc that we call in because they get in there and they say, oh, there's a hole there. Let's get the surgeon in now. And, and as you can tell, it becomes a five alarm mess. Um, any spillage from the stomach into the abdomen can cause a chemical peritonitis. Uh, but when you combine that with hemorrhage, of course, uh, it's, it's the equivalent of a trauma resuscitation. You just bleed out. So there are all kinds of GI problems associated with this. Now, let's say the person inhales it or ingests it or something like that, and it goes through first pass metabolism through the liver. What happens? Well, in particular, the most studied chemical ever for hepatotoxicity when it comes to hydrocarbons is carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride, in case anybody doesn't know its usual use, is when you see Stanley Steam or any carpet cleaners come out and you get that little chemical smell, it's carbon tetrachloride. It's a great carpet cleaner. And it's used with industrial applications in the carpeting industry. A lot of times when you get brand new carpet, you walk through that new car showroom smell you can smell the plastics and the vinyl on the carpet. Then you walk into a carpet place and you kind of get reminiscent of the same smell. See, after effects of carbon tetrachloride, which you're smelling in a carpet place and such, are other things as well. But that's one of them. Now, it's not enough to do you any danger, any harm. But you can imagine if you're in an enclosed space using carbon tetrachloride, or if you're in a prolonged period of time, like you're the professional carpet cleaner and such, you'll find that long-term exposure can be just as deadly as a short-term exposure. 
all of a sudden you arrive on the scene and you have a little bit of a smell going around the house. Did you have the carpets cleaned here or anything like that? And no, but I do work around carbon tetrachloride. Well, all of a sudden they're jaundiced. So now they got liver shut down as a result of this. Uh, unfortunately, in today's uh, narcissistic society where people don't donate their organs, uh, we've got very few kidneys left. We got even fewer livers. And so if you, by the time you develop your jaundice and die from liver failure, you don't have a prayer of getting on a liver list. You're gone. It's done. So this becomes a real problematic for us to try and recover the liver. A lot of times it involves hemodialysis to try and take the toxins out of the body. Keep in mind with hydrocarbon poisoning, it's usually the metabolite that it degrades into or is broken down into that causes the poisoning, not so much the initial chemical. You see that a lot, and we'll get into a lecture probably the next time. Actually, the next time that we, uh, we meet, we'll get an ethylene glycol, and you'll find that ethylene glycol by itself is uh, non-toxic. But once it gets into the liver and it gets broken down by the liver enzymes, toxic substances are produced, which are deadly. And so the objective is, is to prevent the breakdown and then let the liver and the, uh, I'm sorry, let the kidneys clear the ethylene glycol, the antifreeze. But we'll get into that lecture uh, the next time around. It's, it's kind of an interesting chemical and in how we go about treating it. In addition to carbon tetrachloride, which affects the liver, and you'll get into a word association game sometimes with the National Registry. They'll say which one of these chemicals is associated with the most uh, toxicity for this organ. Toluene will be for the uh, renal, ethylene glycol or te carbon tetrachloride will be for the liver. And of course, uh, just a gazillion hydrocarbons uh, any hydrocarbon that's out there is going to affect the heart and the brain. But here we go to toluene, which is an aromatic hydrocarbon as well. It causes distal renal tubular acidosis, and this is very important. Once you get the acidosis that develops, no matter if it's diabetic ketoacidosis, alcoholic ketoacidosis, or acidos metabolic acidosis due to poisoning, they're all going to look and say the same. In other words, they're all going to be small respirations, trying to blow off the acid altered mental status, and they may have some variations in their sugar. One would think, well, I got on a scene, the sugar is 400, but he look at he's Kusmal, and I smell that fruity acetone breath. Oh, my God, it must be, you know, some sort of diabetic emergency. So you rush him into the emergency room. We get the patient in, and when we start getting electrolytes back and, and some of the other tests that we have, all of a sudden it's showing a, a pretty different picture. So history as you get on the scene is gonna be most important here. In other words, what, what happened? How did it happen? Where does he work? What does he do? These are all very important clues as to what might be going on. And the patient looks acidotic, but is not diabetic. Now, renal failure. Well, renal failure can be a real problem here. Um, with the toluene and some of the other hydrocarbons, renal failure comes about as a result of uh, breakdown of the renal tubular, renal tube being part of the nephron system, what happens is that you deplete all the bicarb that's in the kidney. The bicarb helps us maintain our acid base balance within the body. So if you've got a chemical that's going to break down or destroy the kidney, one of the major things you have to worry about, the immediate killer is going to be metabolic acidosis. You start getting too acidotic, your myocardium goes crazy, gets highly sensitized, catecholamines hit, or you give a dose of epinephrine to try and reverse whatever's going on out there. And since it's sensitized to catecholamines, to adrenaline, and you're giving them adrenaline, uh, you can actually throw the person to V-fib. And this is going to be a very important point. I'll reinforce it a bit later in the lecture, but this is why in a known hydrocarbon poisoning, no matter what your resuscitation efforts are, you have to avoid epinephrine. Now, this is the difference between a layperson, an EMT, and a paramedic and a physician. At the paramedic physician level, we know when not to give epinephrine. And this is one of these times when you have sensitization of the myocardium to catecholamines as a result of hydrocarbon poisoning. So if you should mysteriously see this on a national registry test, 
to say which medication is not indicated and you see epinephrine, and that is going to be your answer. Not that I have any special knowledge, but you should know that. All right. We keep pressing on. Hematological. Look, when you've got exposure to benzene, especially in the aircraft industry, but any of the heavy machinery, if you're a heavy machinery of a 150 mechanic, Union 150 uh, covers all the heavy heavy machinery mechanics and such. They're around all kinds of hydraulic fluids and such. Those are all hydrocarbons. And of course, they have the heavier motor oils and such. They've got the different gasolines. But there's also benzene that's involved with certain pieces of the hydraulic system as well as the uh, other cooling systems that have to keep these big engines cool to do the heavy duty work that they do. Benzene exposure, especially on the skin, or inhaled if there is a fire on one of these machineries can be pretty deadly. And it doesn't manifest itself so much in an acute situation uh, as it does in a chronic situation. So let's talk about the acute because that's easier. The acute situation, you're gonna get some hemolysis. All of a sudden you, you come to work, they have morning with a hemoglobin of 15 and they show up in the emergency room with a hemoglobin of seven. It's actually destroying the red blood cells as we speak. That causes hemolysis, the red blood cells can't bind oxygen, and the next thing you know, you've got half your blood volume missing because the red blood cells have been breaking down left and right. So your patients come in and need some sort of fluid and trauma resuscitation because what's released from the exploding red blood cells, hemoglobin and myoglobin, that all goes to the kidneys, and if it's not flushed with appropriate fluids, they start building casts within the kidney. Those casts then shut down the kidney permanently. That's the acute situation. You see that with the condition called rhabdomyolysis, and this is what you have to worry about with hydrocarbon poisonings, is that you could send somebody into an acute rhabdomyolysis. That's when you get into kidney failure. So there's two things that the paramedic would do out in the field. Number one, you plug in two lines and you run two liters into the patient fairly quickly. The second, if they've got a respiratory rate of 30 and they're taking nice deep coup small type breaths, then you already know they're acidotic. You don't need no ISTAT or blood test to tell you that they're acidotic. And you go ahead and give an amp a bicarb. This does two things. Number one, it raises the pH and protects the kidneys from the crystallizing effects of the hemoglobin and the myoglobin. And second, by doing this, it keeps the blood from coagulating or crystallizing within the kidney and therefore can be urinated right out with the addition of the two liters of fluid. So your role in the field here may seem to be limited, but it's probably that first 15 to 30 minutes after a, a severe hydrocarbon exposure, whether intentional or accidental, that's going to make the difference. And that two liters of fluid, prevention of the aspiration, and the administration of bicarbonate is going to be huge. You may not have it as a protocol. There's not too many ER docs that have ER protocols for hydrocarbon poisonings. This is an opportunity for you to call online medical control where you will receive an order for bicarb. The properly trained paramedic will know that if you get an order for bicarb, not to be surprised. You may also prompt the ER doctor, especially if you go into smaller ERs where they're family practitioners or uh, uh, grandfathered in emergency medicine. In other words, doctors that have been around for so many years that they, they get into emergency medicine. You don't know who you're getting. If you're calling a big major tertiary center, fine. You know, you're going to get a board certified ER doc. They're going to know right away from a toxicology standpoint, bicarb's indicated at least expect the medication. And instead of giving epinephrine or some of the other things that are out there, you're going to be expected to be given fluids bicarb. So a little field tip there for you. Uh, expect the worst, expect strange stuff. Now, from a chronic standpoint, if a person's been exposed to especially benzene, but any of the other hydrolazines and such like that, hydrazines, uh, that it's your fine on aircraft, especially fighter jet aircraft and some of the bigger uh, transport aircraft that the military uses 
or the civilian world uses, you'll find that any exposures here can cause cancers. We traditionally think of cancers as a big old tumor sitting someplace, but the cancers that eat people alive are the blood dysgrasias, the blood cancers. That's gonna be the aplastic anemias, multiple myelomas, and the AMLs, the acute myelogenous leukemia. Myelogenous means bone marrow. The bone marrow kicks out three types of cells, red cells, white cells, and platelets the so-called stem cell line. Well, if you poison the bone marrow, then you're not gonna get anything. You get the aplastic anemia. You're gonna get the multiple myelomas that break up into the bone and such, but the most treacherous of all of them is gonna be the AML. And uh, AML is a, a pretty wicked disease to have when you're an adult. Bone marrow transplants and such tend not to do uh, as well as they should, like they do in the um, child. All right, so let's talk a little bit about statistics. Now that we know that hydrocarbon vapor, hydrocarbon absorption, hydrocarbon ingestions, I don't know anybody who injects them, but if they do, they're, you know, they're, of course, they're suicide uh, attempt or are totally intent on uh, leaving this world and the injections, although I've never heard of one, I would imagine uh, somebody has tried something. Statistics, morbidity, mortality, over 1,000 deaths, 2010 to 2015 due to hydrocarbons reported just to the U.S. Poison Control Centers alone. Hundreds of deaths are classified due to chemical cleaning substances. Remember the cleaning substance, carbon tetrachloride? Yeah. Fumes, gas, vaporizers, and of course, pesticides. Now, if you join me for one of my previous lectures, you found that the organophosphates are responsible for a certain number of deaths, especially in the farming industrial uh, industries uh, where the uh, organophosphates are used uh, to virtually kill bugs in, in farm fields and such like that or in other types of botanical situations, whether it's uh, environmental or whether it's research. And subsequently, those deaths too are sometimes attributed to uh, just natural causes and such when in fact they've been due to some sort of hydrocarbon or pesticide or organophosphate poisoning. True numbers higher. We don't know how many people die every year from this 250,000 uh, over five years. We don't know. We don't know. And that's just the U.S. If any of you have the good fortune to travel to developing countries, uh, third world, what we consider to be third world countries, but they're developing countries and such. They don't have roadways and internal water and plumbing and all the other stuff. Those are developing. Uh, you're going to find that uh, these type of poisonings are well underreported. Uh, broken pipelines, national pipelines. Nigeria is just getting into it right now where they're drilling with the Shell Oil Company off the coast of their country to start uh, uh, refining and selling oil on the markets. Subsequently, accidents from that occur all the time because of lack of safety regulations and such in those countries that, that they don't have here or some of the other uh, uh, European and Asian countries and such. So hydrocarbon poisoning, uh, very much underreported. And if you have a fortune of going to some of those third world countries, uh, this is something that is a bigger problem than it is here in the United States. Okay, statistically, more fatalities are associated with children younger than five who often ingest hydrocarbons. Uh, these would be the uh, kitties that get in underneath the kitchen sink or get out into the garage, especially when they swallow gasoline. Um, gasoline has a smell to it that literally attracts some people. It's not an offensive smell, you're just overpowering. We learn as adults to stay away from it because we learned as children when it got on our skin or when it got too, too close to it, you could burn your nose and such. But there are some kids out there that are willing to try anything. And, and of course, little children don't know any better. There's also other hydrocarbons, including the mineral spirits. Mineral spirits uh, have been used for a lot of years and they actually have a great smell to them. They have a spirit smell to them, almost like a menthol uh, uh, smell to them. And of course, that's very attractive to children as well. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. So 
Anyway, inhalant abuse becoming increasingly common among adolescents. It's estimated about 20% of students in middle and high school have abused these substances in this way. I'm not talking about cocaine, heroin, crack, marijuana, and all that other stuff. That's a different type of poisoning altogether. But 20%, one in five of these students report at least huffing or bagging at least once to see if they like it or don't like it. It's just the peer pressure. It's the world we live in. Just be aware, you're going to be the first one called. Now, what do we do? As paramedics, we arrive on the scene and the suspected hydrocarbon intoxication or kind of poisoning. First thing to do is find out what it is, how did it get there? Is it this type of hydrocarbon? Is it this type of chemical? Was it inhaled? Was it ingested? Was it injected? Is this the resort? Uh, the result of an explosion that it got on the hands or something uh, happened where it sprayed all over the place? <clears throat> or was it uh, intentional? Uh, was it a huffing or bagging? You want to know how much was done, what time it was done, and then any co adjustments that may be possible with it. Yeah, you guys were huffing. What were you doing before that? Oh, we were smoking some THC. What was on it? Uh, let's see, uh, Rifenol, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, GHB, maybe some bat salts, you know, who knows? These are all going to play into it that are very important. And that question at least has to be asked. So back to the lung again. We know that this is the most injured organ when it comes to hydrocarbons. We know that it's the most popular way uh, for the poison to enter the system. It can also be the result of ingestion, which then results in aspiration as well. This is particularly deadly. Like I said, it carries 100% mortality if they aspirate. Look, if a person's uh, altered mental status from hydrocarbon, from huffing, or from bagging of whatever kid it is, and they seem to be altered, uh, they're going to start throwing up. And so your job is twofold here. You can play it safe and RSI the patient and put in an ET tube, in which case you know, they can vomit all day and they're not going to get it into their lungs. Or you can put on some oxygen, start an IV, give them a lot of Zofran and hope they don't vomit. And worse yet, hope they don't vomit and aspirate. It doesn't take much to get down into the lungs. If they're already altered mental status, you got a big decision to make. And all I want you to do is be able to make that decision, make the best judgment you can, document it to support why you did what you did. Okay. All right. 30 minutes. Doesn't take long. Coughing, gagging, choking occurs within 30 minutes, but it can be up to several hours. So you may get called to the scene of parents who are concerned about their child. They woke up three and four o'clock in the morning, a 16 year old kid coughing and gagging and such like that. And one of the first questions you're going to ask is, did you do anything earlier tonight? Got to do it outside the presence of the parents so that they admit it to you. Any huffing, any bagging, get to know the street lingo. They're not going to know if you, well, were you practicing with any kind of uh, uh, propellants tonight? You know, they're going to look at you like, you, you know, like they just don't know what you're talking about. But huffing and bagging are the big ones. And you're going to need to talk with them in their language to find out what they've been doing. Okay. So you get on the scene and you got a kid that's really going south on you and they've got all kinds of PVCs going on the monitor and they continue to cough and gag. Maybe they even got some aspiration. Now, well, how bad does the aspiration have to be in order to cause a 100% mortality? The answer is a heck of a lot less than it would with any other ingestion. It doesn't take much. We've all been in bed. We've all lied in bed and sometime at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden you feel... Geez, do I got some heartburn? And then you get all of a sudden, you got all this ass in the back of your throat. You haven't quite vomited, but it just reflexed out of nowhere. And that's as normal adults without doing this stuff. Hydrocarbon is going to make that a whole lot easier to do. And should they not catch it in time or should they be laying on the back if they're back sleepers and such, all they got to do is aspirate a little bit. They come on the scene, they got wheezing, coughing, um, abdominal pain, dyspnea, tachypnea, cyanosis. Uh, they've got all these things. All badness is going on here. Do not hesitate to intubate. Not at all. Make sure your ISR protocols are up to date. They're appropriate. And make sure that you're getting tubes into these people before badness really happens. 
All right, for many patients, they develop a transient cough. It's a, kind of a nagging cough, something that we all get in our life. But then as a little bit more time goes on through the night, they develop a more prolonged cough. And then they start coughing to the point where you think they almost have whooping cough. And then they cough to the point where you think that they're going to have post-tussive vomiting. In other words, coughing so hard you throw up. That's when the aspiration starts becoming a uh, problem because with coughing comes what? Syncope. If you're coughing that hard, you're going to pass out. How many times have you coughed hard and thought you were going to pass out? Throw in a hydrocarbon propellant or whatever you're going to throw in there, and you got, again, very high probability of aspiration. And again, one more time, I have to say it, 100% mortality if they aspirate. So we keep going now. We got the, we're back to the brain. The most common CNS symptoms include lethargy, decreased mental status, headache, transient euphoria. Again, it gets into the hippocampus, which is the pleasure centers of the brain, if you will. And subsequently, that euphoria stimulates all kinds of just great feelings about them. And they become adverse to situational awareness. In other words, they haven't figured out danger assessment. It could be distorted. What I mean by distorted is, hey, I can jump in front of this car and jump out of the way way before they even get close to me. I can go outside. Like two years ago, I had a guy that was huffing, went outside here in Texas, and what do you think he wanted to play with? Oh, hey, look at that. I got this golden brown looking snake sitting in a corner here. I'll bet I can grab it before it bites me. So after three bites to him and he near collapsed, uh, we got him in with the copperhead bite. And of course, he's euphoric at the time, but now he's trying to die on us because he was playing with the little kitty snakes. And uh, they took him, took him down. He survived, uh, but he, he had a problem afterwards uh, from a neurotoxic stamp. Uh, I'm sorry, from a neural asphyxia standpoint with the huffing compounded by the hematological toxin of a copperhead. And it became a, a real problem to manage this guy. And three weeks in the ICU was, was pretty much what it took. All right. Again, the solvents are highly lipophilic. So they love fat. They love the brain. The brain's going to get uh, pretty much 75% of it, just like anywhere in the body at any given time. If you got a glucose of 100, 75% of the utilization of the glucose in your body is by the brain. Here's another tidbit. I saw this on an exam. Can't tell you which exam, but I saw this on the exam. If you don't have glucose in the blood, the brain cells die. Very simple. Get below 30 on your blood sugar level, 50% of the patients die. The lower you get, the more people die. But without glucose, the brain cells die. How does glucose get into the brain cell? Insulin. Therefore, a patient who does not take his insulin every day or decides to bypass it for three days and comes into you with altered mental status, you see he's got a sugar of 400, but none of the sugar can get into the brain cell. Why? Because sugar cannot cross into the brain cell by itself. Insulin has to grab it and transport it into the brain cell or else brain cells die. Couldn't believe it. It was a test question. All right. So central nervous system now, in addition to displacement of glucose and such, we've got prolonged exposure, which then starts breaking down the nerves themselves. Think of the nerves as electrical wiring in your house. You got this nice color code around it, whether it's white, black, or red, there's a nice plastic covering around it. The nerves are the same way. They have that plastic covering called myelin. Myelin is a protein. And so when you get enough huffing or bagging in your lifetime, these chemicals get in, and the first thing they do is they start breaking down myelin. You see it in the periphery, fingertips, hands, and such like that, but then it starts to ascend. What I mean by ascend is it moves from the periphery to central. And so it can mimic Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. 
any one of the leuco, uh, leucoplastic syndromes within the brain, um, it can also mimic um, the demyelinating diseases such as amyotropic lateral sclerosis and such in high enough doses, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, that, of course, is a is a fatal disease. Nobody's ever survived it in the history of the world. Nobody will survive in the history of the world until we get some handle on it. But these are the Parkinson's multiple sclerosis, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. These are all the known diseases that cause a breakdown of myelin. We also know that when you inhale hydrocarbons, you can develop Parkinson's multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, you can break down the nerves in your body to the point where it progresses to the central nervous system, break down myelin in the spinal cord, and you've got yourself pretty much a paralysis. It's slow, it's insidious, it's a long-term effect. It does not occur with one or two episodes, but as time goes on, you should know the long-term effects of hydrocarbons and being around the mechanical industry when you're working with hydrocarbon fluids and solvents and such especially mechanics they know getting this stuff on their skin smell it all the time such like that one day it's going to take a toll on them can't tell you the importance of adequate ventilation proper protective gear and clothing and of course a heightened awareness of what these things can do to you oh and then we go to the heart all right here's the heart Cardiotoxicity, dyspnea, syncope, sensitization of the myocardium to catecholamines. We talked about that earlier. Here's the common scenario. We've seen this published many times in emergency medicine literature, but here it comes. The teenage kid who's huffing her bag in his room late at night. Parent comes in, startles him. What happens with the startle reflex? Adrenaline fight or flight syndrome. You get this big surge of adrenaline right out of the adrenal glands all of a sudden. Well, now you got a sensitized myocardium. Remember, it used to be at 90, now it's at 45. Doesn't take much to trigger that cell to get uh, depolarized in the fire. But imagine a couple million cells within the myocardium just wait for that aberrant signal to come in from anywhere, whether it's a PVC or whether it's a startle reflex and you throw the kid in the atrial fib, more often than not, you throw them in the V-fib, they collapse and die right in front of them, right in front of their parents. So the startle reflex is huge here, which is why, once again, I wanna reinforce with you, if you suspect the hydrocarbon poisoning, you can't really give epinephrine. You're gonna keep them in permanent V-fib. We'll never get them out of it. What's the alternative, you might ask? You got a nice class three antiarrhythmic sitting in all your boxes right now. now for extra credit here, and I'm gonna give somebody here a big star. As I look at the chat box now, can you tell me what antiarrhythmic I would use in this particular case? Outstanding, Brenda. Amiodarone, very good. What else could you use? Yeah, I could use a beta blocker, I could use lidocaine, but since we're talking about depolarization, repolarization, what's the big ion that does that? Potassium. What is amiodarone? It's a class three antiarrhythmic. What class does that belong to? Potassium. It's gonna start blocking potassium. So nicely done, Brenda, very well. Okay, you can also use a class two, which is a beta blocker. Any one of those answers would be right. And you're going to see amiodarone, and you're going to see metoprolol, you're going to see lidocaine, and then you're going to see epinephrine. It's going to say, which one of these drugs don't you use? And remember, the key here is if it's a hydrocarbon poisoning, a hydrocarbon inhalation, anything that has to do to huffing or bagging, you're not going to give epinephrine. I would give the amiodarone even to get them out of V-fib. Hell, we're using an ACLS code anyway to get them out, right? Epi's not working, Epi's not working, CPR, CPR, Epi's not working, comes the third round, amiodarone 300. Why not? So bypass the epinephrine when you're in cardiac arrest and a known huffer or, or bagger and hydrocarbon and go with the amiodarone right away. 
this is why you're paramedics. You get to use your independent judgment here. And when you figure out that they're in full arrest from hydrocarbon, you don't follow ACLS. Follow your training. Okay, so um, I think the obvious is being stated on the rest of these slides. We're in a, um, um, you know, one of these things where people write articles, uh, write articles for a particular reason, and that's because they cover the epidemiology of it all. So you can you can break down any exposure into the obvious. Yeah, you know, it was intentional. Uh, it was not intentional. It was accidental. It was not intentional. It was accidental, but who did it involve? Okay, children. All right, we get that. Children are curious about everything. I get that. Um, but once they get it in their mouth, they tend to spit it out. So children don't tend to die with hydrocarbon carbon poisonings as much as adults do because they're not exposed to as much. They're not in the mechanical repair field. They're certainly not around airplane engines or, or uh, some of the other uh, propellants that they use to pressurize paint cans and such. Uh, so children will get a bit of a mount. They'll be sick for a little bit, but we tend not to see deaths from poisonings of hydrocarbons in children. We see that that's really in the 15 to 19 year old group, 20 year old group. And then again, we see that in the 40 to 45 year old age group where you've got the long-term effects of the hydrocarbon poisonings. And of course, then you got the recreational guys, junior high school and high school age children. All right. Pre-hospital care, let's go over it again. One more time before we wrap this up. And again, the hydrocarbon subject is chosen because there's a lot of questions on it on the National Registry Paramedic. So pre-hospital care focuses on decam contamination. That's if you get the big, big exposure. Wash them down, get it off of their body. GI decontamination, no role in pre-hospital care. If you want to give activated charcoal, go ahead, just hope that the patient doesn't become altered mental status afterwards and give you bigger problems like with the aspirations. So you're gonna remove the uh, hydrocarbon really from the skin or you're gonna remove them from the environment where they got the inhalation and such. You don't, you wanna keep nice and calm to prevent arrhythmias. I would use Ativan here and again, I might even sedate them and paralyze them just so I don't excite them, put them in a deep sleep just so you don't excite them until you get the hydrocarbon out of them. Everybody with even a, a remote exposure of hydrocarbon, the paramedics need to be coming into the hospital with their patients and I should be seeing oxygen, IVs, cardiac monitor. That's the minimum care. Okay. Do it in a safe manner. Don't be screaming 100 miles per hour. Hell, that's anxiety provoking just, just like it is right there. If you got to, use the Ativan. Make sure you bring the poison into the hospital if possible. Anybody who's showing any kind of respiratory problems should get rapid sequence intubation for definitive airway management. As soon as you blow up that little bulb and you got it nice and tight in the trachea, they're not going to aspirate. You've taken the 100% mortality aspiration off the table. That's a good thing. I, I tend to use intubation in these patients more than I do CPAP or BiPAP, but only because of the risk of aspiration and the risk of them going altered mental status on you right away. Okay, and then we talked about this ad nauseum. You can use lidocaine, am amiodarone, and beta blockers can be used for the antiarrhythmics. VFib gets amiodarone. VFib conversion gets lidocaine or amiodarone drips, or you can even use a beta blocker. To, to help with these people. The key here is not to use epinephrine. All right, so you get a GI tract. We get we got some debate about this going on. Do we use activated charcoal in the field? Do we not use it? Do we use it? Do we don't use it? Blah, blah, blah. So um, activated charcoal don't really absorb hydrocarbons very well. And we don't do, we don't trap tubes into these people and start pumping their stomachs anymore. So it's one of these damned if you do, damned if you don't. I tend to use, once I get them intubated on a ventilator, I tend to put a boatload of activated charcoal into them, but I also use sorbitol in the activated charcoal. The reason being that high concentration of sugar, sorbitol is a sugar, can get the GI tract moving so quickly 
that if I give another dose in two hours and then another dose in two hours, somewhere around between the second and third dose, they're going to start having bowel movements where I'm loaded with charcoal, which means I've transited the entire 24-hour trip that it usually takes from stomach to out into the world. And I've reduced it down to four hours or less by the use of sorbitol. So I've got this poison out of them and at least it blocks their absorption. Now, remember charcoal does one of two things. It can get into the stomach and absorb the poison like a sponge and keep it inactive. Or once it gets into the intestinal tract, it blocks the poison from being absorbed by the body. So I'm not particularly ad opposed to activated charcoal when it comes to hydrocarbon ingestions if it's a large enough ingestion. Okay, if you got somebody who's suicidal drink, if you got a kid that drank a little bit of it, forget it. You know, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about charcoal or anything. That's something for us to handle in the ER, and that's only after a six-hour observation. If we see anything, we act on it. But in the person who swallowed a whole lot of this stuff intentionally because they wanted to commit suicide, then putting activated charcoal into them as a first dose would not be a heartbreaker. Look, these people are probably going to die anyway. But giving them the activated charcoal, at least you're giving them a bit of a chance here. If we've got a small window here, it's going to be because of the activated charcoal. So there's some debate going on. They don't absorb the hydrocarbons well, but at least they block the intestinal tract from being able to absorb the hydrocarbons into them. Do not ever induce vomiting. As a matter of fact, put the epicac away. It's done. I've taken it all out of my protocols. We don't do it anymore. Even when kids swallow, swallow bleach, I tell them to drink a glass of milk. But we're not going to get them to vomit. Intubation is a very, very, very logical preemptive strike. You can get these guys uh, intubated. Uh, you get these guys intubated, you prevent the aspiration, at least you've taken that 100% mortality off the plate. Again, once they aspirate a hydrocarbon, it's pretty much game over. All right, talk a little bit about the class two antiarrhythmics, in other words, the beta blockers, and I think we'll be wrapping this up. We're getting close to nine o'clock now. Um, when you look at the slideshow, You'll see that I've got certain medications on here, but the beta blockers tend to be the favorite child. These type of hydrocarbon poisoning where you're starting to get ventricular dysrhythmias. Now, more than often than not, it's going to be a tachycardia. More often than not, you're going to have PVCs with the tachycardia, which are going to cause fusion beats. Those fusion beats usually lead to bad things like V-fib. So we tend to give beta blockers more so than anything. Blood pressure is going to be up. Pulse rate is going to be up. Knock it down. If your patient's already hypotensive or bradycardic, those are clear contraindications to beta blockers. Never ever use them in hypotension, never ever use them in bradycardia. We may want to use one of the other ones, lidocaine or amiodarone. The point being, the class two antiarrhythmics, they can stabilize the cell as well as slow down the heart. Okay, but you can raise that 45 that I was talking about earlier back up to 90 by stabilizing the cardiac membrane cell. Remember, adrenaline hits those sensitized cells, they go into V-fib. Beta blockers can raise that back up to 90, make it much more difficult for adrenaline to trigger a ventricular fibrillation. And then I would use uh, Versed or Ativan or Valium or whatever benzodiazepine you have, incredibly high doses, get them intubated so you can take over the respirations and then just keep giving them the Ativan to keep them calm but I would also consider the beta blockers as well. Again, that test question is going to be which one of the following drugs aren't you going to use? Amiodarone, metoprolol, recognize the beta blockers. They can list any beta blocker. Uh, lidocaine, and the one that you're not going to use in hydrocarbon poisoning is epinephrine. All right. All right, before we... Um, before we break for the evening, I just want to ask, uh, Amy Roden, would you please comment on high-pressure injection of hydraulic fluid? You know, most of these high-pressure uh, high hydraulic fluids get into the skin. Uh, very rarely does it get shot into the mouth or anything like that. But when it gets underneath the skin, especially uh, some of the guys that use high-pressure uh, uh, 
increase as well as, as the hydraulic fluid, it can cause an unbelievable necrosis. It's like wind debridement. We have to actually flay open if it's a forearm, and typically it is the forearm. We flay it open, lay it out, and then we have to wash it out completely. And then we put it together using um, uh, some, some string, some thread. We don't close it all the way. We leave it open and let it heal by secondary intention so that the rest of the healing can push out the microparticles of the hydrocarbons. Uh, you don't get much toxicity from it from a standpoint of what gets into the bloodstream unless you've had a direct piercing of one of the arteries or veins. But these patients don't go home either. Once they get that underneath the skin, and we open them, we get it all out, and we monitor the patient for several days to make sure they don't become toxic, uh, cardiotoxic, neurotoxic, pulmonary, or, or renal. Uh, but most important, so we don't involve any necrosis of the tissue because of remaining petroleum products within their uh, arm. So when you talk about high pressure or hydraulics uh, causing an injury and such like that, nobody ever stays home or I'm going to be okay. If anything gets injected underneath the skin because of high pressure hydrocarbons or petroleum, they come into the hospital. They're to be transported to the closest appropriate hospital. So this, since this is a trauma and it's got a uh, toxicology attached to it, I would take these people to at least a level three trauma and maybe even to a level one if you're close to one. I hope that answered your question, Brenda. All right, if there's nothing else for this evening, I appreciate everybody being here. And I've got uh, Brandon, Brenda, Graham, Michael, and uh, of course, Jane. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, we will again get this uh, posted on the PERCOM site uh, for you to review at a later time. So if there's nothing further, I bid you good night.